Well, it is always good to be at Southeastern. We feel very much at home here. Um, my wife is from Raleigh originally, so this is sort of hometown. And there's just so many people. I look around this room, um, people that we've known, uh, people who've been a major part of our lives. Um, it is not perhaps that widely known that when I was a freshman at Duke, there was a junior at Duke also a religion major who helped me survive the religion department at Duke. His name's John Hammett, and it's uh, very, very good to, to see him again. Uh, the Aiken family has been dear to us for a long time, and I've had the privilege of working directly with two of the Aiken boys, the younger two, uh, one of whom, the youngest, some of you may not know this, but uh, Tim actually came out and helped me coach the sport of American football in Central Asia. And I got to see your president lapse into coach mode. And I tell you, he can yell with the best of them. It's really good. Um, as we kick off this week thinking about missions, and but continue the series you guys have been t- doing through the Psalms, I'd like you to look at Psalm 96. So if you'd open your Bibles to Psalm 96, we're going to be working our way through this and seeing where it takes us in our understanding of the task of missions. Psalm 96, beginning with verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people's in his faithfulness. Let's pray. Father, our yearning and desire is to not just understand your word, but to be changed by it. And I pray that you would give us minds to understand what your Holy Spirit inspired. I pray that you would also give us hearts to love what you have written in your word and wills to embrace it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a hymn. This is a song of worship to God. And I know many of you have had Old Testament poetical uh, classes and you're familiar with the different types of psalms. This is very simply a hymn, which means that it gives you a summons to praise and then reasons for praise and then a recapitulation of the whole thing. But it opens up the question for us, what is worship anyway? Is worship an experience we offer people, an experience we come to church or to a chapel service to have? Is the content of our worship just things that stir our emotions, or does it even really matter that much what the content is as long as the music is just right and it gets us in the right mood? What, what is worship? And I would furthermore add, as we consider this question of worship, because this is Missions Week, what is the task of missions, and specifically, what is evangelism? So when you think about evangelism, what images come to your mind? Do you think of reading through a tract? Do you think of buttonholing somebody and then very awkwardly uh, reciting a memorized script? Do you think of, oh, that's something I just dread doing, but I know I ought to do? What do you think of when you think of evangelism? And more fundamentally, perhaps, than both of these questions, what is worship and what is evangelism? Because I believe this text addresses both. What is the gospel? Is the gospel simply a mechanism for personal fulfillment? Is it fire insurance 
by the way, less and less these days since not many people believe in hell anymore. Who or what is the focal point? Is it the person being addressed? Are they the point of the gospel as it so often seems? And how is one to respond? Is the proper response to the gospel doing what certainly many of us in my age, including me, did, which was to walk an aisle and shake the preacher's hand? Is it to pray a prayer? Uh, had a, a, a friend in college, a guy named, named Greg Goss, who had grown up Roman Catholic, and a group of people came around sharing the four spiritual laws. And being a good Catholic, he, of course, just nodded his agreement through all of it. And then they said, pray this prayer. So he did. And they walked away assuming that he was born again. And like the good Catholic that he was, he thought, well, every night I do three Hail Marys and three Our Fathers. I'll now do three sinners' prayers along with them every night. Um, And it was at some point later that he actually got saved. But what is all this? I believe Psalm 96 sheds light on these questions. Now, my fundamental conviction in approaching this is that there's an essential continuity in Scripture such that the Old Testament is God's Word not just for national Israel, but for us as well. It's that Israel was given a missionary task. Now, what they saw in figures and types, we see fully in Christ, but we can and must see the Old Testament in light of Christ and see Christ through the lenses of the Old Testament. So, Psalm 96 is the Word of God to Israel, but it's the Word of God about their missionary task, and it remains the Word of God to us about ours. Well, what is the content of our message? It's not about how you can be spiritually fulfilled or have the best life now. It's not about us. The gospel is good news about God. In too many gospel presentations, God only gets mentioned briefly and incompletely. But biblically, God in his attributes and actions, God in all his glory, is the content of the gospel. And that's what we get right here in Psalm 96. It is a psalm about God that includes his marvelous deeds in salvation. It's very simple. Again, summons to praise, but always followed by reasons for praise. Biblical worship and biblical evangelism have theological content at their very heart, and the theological content is who God is and what God has done. So, we, we look at the summons and ask ourselves, well, who is being summoned? Well, certainly the people who are reading the psalm is being summoned, but interestingly enough, so are the heavens and the earth. The whole world is being summoned to the praise of God. And the setting is not the temple and not even the assembly of God's people. This is addressed to non-believers. This is addressed to the nations. They are the ones who are being summoned to praise God our God. So, the readers and hearers of this psalm are commanded to declare God's glory, to tell of His salvation, to announce the marvelous things He has done, to proclaim His sovereign lordship over heaven and earth, to rejoice in His coming judgment, and they are to proclaim those things to unbelieving Gentiles. And that is essentially the missionary task that God gave Israel. This is an Old Testament type of the Great Commission. And it's altogether appropriate to put the telling of his salvation and declaring his glory in parallel to one another because the saving acts of God are a brilliant display of the glory of God. In fact, it is in him acting to save us that we most clearly see his glory depicted. And what was true in an anticipatory sense in the Old Testament is even clearer and brighter in the New Testament gospel. So the gospel of salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the clearest display in human history of the glory of God in his varied attributes. He died, he did it precisely for the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1 tells us that. So let's think for just a moment about the things that are said here, the things we learn about God, and realize how clearly displayed they are in the saving acts of God. So you have the attributes of God, the acts of God, and they form one picture together. We see his holiness which is the very thing that makes our salvation necessary. You do realize, I hope, that we are fundamentally saved by God from God. And we need to be saved from God because He is holy. And He cannot cannot coexist 
with anything that is wicked or evil. And being a just God, he can and must punish all that is evil. So him coming to judge the earth in righteousness is actually not good news if we are only to stand before him on our own record. But that is, in fact, the necessary backdrop for even the gospel message. That it's because God is a righteous and just God who will not leave sin unpunished that we need a Savior to begin with. One of the things that's frustrating often in sharing the gospel with Muslims, which is where I've spent most of my adult life, is that their understanding of the transcendence of God is such that God can simply decide he's not going to care about sin. God has no intrinsic attributes. And so he can simply decide, okay, I'm going to forgive that one. I'm not going to forgive that one. And that's that. That's all there is to it. He can arbitrarily exercise his sovereignty in that fashion. The God of the Bible is gloriously different from that. The God of the Bible is gloriously internally constrained by who he is. He cannot deny himself. He cannot be anything or anyone other than who he is. And he is a holy and just God, which makes the whole thing absolutely necessary. And so that brings us to his wrath and the fear that is due him. This is the necessary backdrop to an understanding of the gospel. And yet we have his love and his mercy and his grace more clearly displayed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus than anywhere else. And so even though the psalmist could perceive something of the glory of these attributes at work in God's work of salvation, we see it most clearly in our Lord Jesus. The gospel is the good news about God. And that is fundamental for us. And so the task of evangelism and missions is fundamentally not a life insurance transaction. It is fundamentally an act of worship. What are we doing when we share the gospel? We are declaring his glory among the nations. His glory most clearly displayed in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a declaration of the attributes and acts of God, specifically in regard to salvation. And it is done so, we're also given the attitude here, in an attitude of reverent fear and joyful triumph. We are called on to tremble before him, and we are also called on to rejoice in this passage. It's not necessarily making your way to the end of a memorized presentation. God defined the content, which is his glory, displayed in his marvelous acts of salvation. God defined the focus, and the focus is on him. The best thing we can do for somebody is to get their focus off of themselves and onto God. Because it's then that they will realize their need for a Savior, and it's then that they're going to realize that only He can be that Savior. And He's defined our attitude, exuberant joy and reverent fear. And then He also declared to us the response that He requires. So what response are we after? If evangelism is an act of worship, it is also a summons to worship. And what we're ultimately calling on people to do is to join us in lives entirely focused on giving worship and praise to God. So it's not a summons to pray a prayer or walk an aisle, although those may be used by God in in the salvation of many, to do those things and then to go on with a mildly modified but still deeply self-focused life. Instead, this is a summons to a life and to eternity of God-focused, God-obsessed worship. The people of God are commanded to worship God in the hearing of the nations, and the nations are commanded to join in the worship. I mean, just listen to the summons that are given in this psalm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations, glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. That's a summons to the nations to give God the glory that he is due. Tremble before him all the earth. I heard a a chapel speaker in seminary once say that the purpose of evangelism and missions is to recruit for the choir. That's what we're doing. We are recruiting for the choir of heaven. We are recruiting those who will join us in this life and most gloriously in the life to come to give God the praise and honor and worship that are his due. That's what our task is. 
That also means, by the way, that our worship itself, we've already answered the question there, worship is not an experience we offer people, worship is an act of reverence we offer God, and the content matters. Just as in the Psalms, there's a summons to to worship and then reasons for worship. And those reasons are found in the attributes and acts of God. So our worship and our evangelism seamlessly need to have that same fixed focus on God and to be rich in content about who God is and what he has done. Well, so that's what we're supposed to be doing. The other question that this psalm answers is the question, what is the scope of our task? If the nature of the task is worship, if the response we are seeking is ultimately worship, how broad is the scope of it? Well, let's look at the text. Verse 1 tells us that this summons goes to all the earth. Verse 3 tells us that this goes to the nations or the Gentiles, the goyim. Verse 3 also says it's all the peoples. Verse 7 says it's families of nations. Verse 9, all the earth. Verse 10, the nations. And this is a consistent Old Testament theme, literally from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to the end and then carried over into the New Testament, that even when God had narrowed his focus on one family and one nation, that his purpose, his intention all along was that his salvation would reach to the ends of the earth and to all the peoples of of the earth. And so to to, to quote the, the metrical version of Psalm 100, all peoples that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. From the promise to Abraham that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed, all the way on to the great uh, multitude that will be worshiping him before his throne in Revelation 7 from every tribe and language and people and nation. This is the scope of the task. So, just to summarize, what's, what is the nature of the task? The nature of the task is to worship God in the presence of the nations in order to summons them to also join us in the right sort of worship, which is a worship of humility and trust, repentance and faith. The content of it is who God is and what he has done. The scope of it is every people group, every nation on the face of the earth. So given that, I think it's only appropriate to uh, begin a missions emphasis week by asking this very simple question, well, how are we doing? If even the Old Testament psalm writers knew this, if it got repeated over and over again in the New Testament, if it's the vision of where history is going in the book of Revelation, where do we stand now? And the answer is, well, there's a whole lot left still to do. I don't know if you know this or not, but in November, the population of the earth uh, passed the 8 billion mark. Just to put things in context, uh, the year that your president and I were born, there were 2.9 billion people on the planet. And there's now 8 billion people on this planet. Of those 8 billion, approximately somewhere between 3 and 4, now closer to 4 billion of them, have zero access to the gospel. None. And it's Another sermon, another talk, but hopefully you are all convinced, as I believe Scripture teaches, that there is no salvation apart from hearing and trusting in the gospel of Jesus. And more people, quite a few more people than were alive the year I was born, right now live on this planet with zero access to that gospel. None. Those people make up about... 6,000 of the 11,000 people groups on the earth. And so a little more than half. But then even of the other 4 billion or so, they are technically within access of the gospel. But just to give you a sense of what that's like, there is far more access to the gospel by far here in North Carolina than there is in most countries of the earth. And so many of them are technically not unreached, but have still never heard the good news of Jesus. The the task is vast. In the meanwhile, the workers, unfortunately, still are few. So at the IMB, one of my responsibilities is the assessment and deployment process. Um, We are in the 
glorious position right now where we can send more missionaries than we have people in our pipeline. Did you hear me say that? We can send more now because the generosity of Southern Baptists through co-offer program and Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we can send more than we have candidates. And our workers on the field in every part of the globe are crying out for help. I mean, we've got 3,500 workers for 8 billion people. No, we're not the only ones, and we know that. We're very grateful for the other organizations. We put us all together, and it's still a pretty small amount. Let me add that Southeastern Seminary is still the number one missionary sending seminary of the Southern Baptist schools. And we're very, very grateful to you for that partnership. But y'all can do so much more, so much more. Um, I would even challenge you to something like, when when we were at Gordon-Conwell, actually, uh, our goal was to tithe our graduating classes to to the mission field. That'd be a a fun thing to do. You, You could exceed that, but I still think you could do that. How do you do that? How do you get there? Well, let me encourage you from what you've already heard to think very seriously about the short-term mission trips that are being sent. What we have noticed is that the overwhelming majority of people who end up career missionaries began with a short-term mission trip. That was, that was that's sort of the gateway drug that'll get you all the way in, and it's a great way to start. Um, Now, when you do this, please go with a humble servant heart that doesn't say, I am here to save the world. It says, I am here to serve the missionaries and to serve local believers, because otherwise they will not be happy you're there. But by all means, I would encourage you to be constant in prayer. I would encourage you to be uh, faithful in giving to missions. I mean, I would encourage you to recognize the importance of going. So, with all of that said, we've got this psalm here that tells us that we are to declare the glory of God among the nations. The glory of God is most clearly seen in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, where justice and love met in as dramatic a fashion as ever in human history. Most of the earth still has not had that declared in their hearing. So what practically should you do? Well, first of all, let me encourage you to be engaged in sharing the gospel where you are. There are still plenty of lost people right here. Here in Wake Forest, here in Wake County, here in North Carolina. There are still people who haven't heard about Jesus. And that number is growing as the number of Uh, church attenders drops off in our culture in this this present cultural moment. By all means, do it right, but do it. Get involved in it. Make yourself accountable. One of the things that we do as part of our field personnel orientation, uh, we send all of the missionaries in training out into the city of Richmond in teams to do contact evangelism. Now, we pair up each one of those teams with what we know to be a solid church, and that church will also often send people to go along with our missionary candidates, no, not candidates, our missionaries in training, and they're there then to do any follow-up after the missionaries have gone off to the field. But we find that it's still terrifying to many of our missionaries in training because it's not something they have that much experience in. Make sure that you are sharing the gospel as part of your life and as part of your lifestyle right now. I would encourage you, in light of what we've just read, to examine the content of your worship and of your witness, to make sure that it's not just a transactional thing, but really does put God at the center, who He is and what He has done as the focus of your witness and of the worship that you do in whatever setting in which you find yourself worshiping. I would also urge you to examine the attitude of your worship and your witness. It should be that that curious biblical combination of fear and joy all at the same time. Um, There there actually is a statement in Hebrews that says that we we should worship God acceptably, which implies that there is unacceptable worship. Now, fear is an acceptable approach. Joy is an acceptable approach. 
Boredom is not an acceptable approach, not even remotely. Neither, I would say, is flippancy. But we need to make sure that our worship has the right content and has the right attitude as we approach God. And then we need to make sure that as we are sharing the gospel, we are doing so in the fear of the Lord. Not as something that we find awkward and just as soon get over with, but recognizing that we have the words of eternal life to offer these people. We have the greatest treasure in the universe to give them. And that literally their eternal destiny is at stake. Our, our evangelism should be characterized by that same sort of joy and fear as we, as, as, as we share the gospel with them. And then cultivate a global vision. You're in a great place to do that. The school still talks, I believe, about every classroom, a Great Commission classroom. Now, this is a great place to get to know the world because what I've discovered, what many of us have discovered, is that the, the, the cultural environment that most of you have grown up in conspires to keep you ignorant of the world. It conspires to keep you very parochial in your perspective. Uh, one of the things I do when I teach intro to missions is uh, require students to pass a map test in which I give them a blank world map. Boundaries are drawn in, but nothing else. And then I will put 10 random countries up on the whiteboard and ask them to find them. I always do a pretest to show them how little they know. And it's amazing how many people do not know where the Sultanate of Brunei is or, or where for that matter, Uzbekistan, which is so easy to find. It's right between, between Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, so you know right where it is. Or even, and this for seminarians is inexcusable, the person who puts Syria where Sweden is. Come on. I mean, you've at least studied the maps in the back of your Bible. You should know where Syria is. But get to know the world. Get to know that this, this place, this teeming planet of people whom God desires to hear the good news of Jesus. Get to know it. Watch the news and not American news. It's all terrible, uh, meaning poor quality. Uh, I, I listen to BBC World News Service. Al, Je Al Jazeera's English language service is good as well. Get to know what's going on in the world so that you can then turn that into fervent prayer for what is happening in the world. Because I pretty well guarantee you anything that happens anywhere is probably affecting the advance of the gospel and may very well be affecting your colleagues. Now, by the grace of God, um, we didn't have anyone affected by the recent tragedy in the Middle East, but we know for certain of local pastors who were killed in that earthquake. And pray for those churches, pray for those believers, pray for their witness. Get to know the world, turn that into fuel for prayer, but then most critically, make sure that you are willing as you pray to be the answer to your prayer. Make sure that you are not putting any boundaries on where you might go or what setting in which you might serve the Lord. I am convinced that no one has the right to go anywhere until they have laid on the table their willingness before God to go anywhere. And we make a great deal of, of sort of, sort of a, a, a mystical deal about calling. And what most of us mean by that, unfortunately, is that we are convinced that we are to stay where we are or someplace that is nice unless we have a vision in the night and then we get up the next morning and look outside and the clouds mystically arrange themselves into our name in the name of a place like Djibouti and then we come to church and there's a prophetic utterance over us that says the same thing and then we might maybe sort of yeah consider it think about it think about this literally from genesis to revelation god's heart is for the nations the specific command is that we are to declare his glory among the nations the great commission is given to the entire church given that reality and given the reality that so much of the world has no access to the gospel, doesn't it make more sense that we go where we're needed most unless God is that specific that we should go somewhere where we're needed less? 
And so my challenge to you is to, to flip your default. Instead of your default being, I will stay where I am unless God dramatically makes it clear I'm to go somewhere else. Your default becomes, I will go where I'm needed most unless God makes it clear that I'm to go somewhere else. My prayer for Southeastern is that you would not simply continue to be the number one missionary sending seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention, but that you would exceed your own record by incredible degrees. My prayer for you all individually is that this week you would not be able to let the question go, that you would continue to consider how can I go and serve where I'm needed most? Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful to you for this school. I'm grateful to you for its leadership, for its professors, for the, the passion for the world that you have placed here. Father, as someone who has been in this area since the 70s, I'm still constantly marveling over preaching a mission sermon from this pulpit, just remembering the way it was when I was in college. Father, thank you for the great work of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would continue to stir up people, that you would stir up people who would have a desire, a passion to go where they're needed most, and they would do so because they have been struck by the magnificence of your glory, and they want to declare it to the world. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.